Hey, how are you? Well, I'm very well. The sun's out. Things looking up. Yes, they are. Um, yeah, I'm very excited about Richard. Talk I know you. I know. I know. Um, as well as a proggy, you're an old folky, aren't you? I, I, you know, I think no. I just went everywhere. I was just, you know, I just sort of ended up getting into all kinds of music as a kid, and uh, and definitely Fairport was in my on my vinyl list. No, they I, absolutely were, but and it was very prevalent, wasn't it? It was just kind of very much around. Although I remember being very. I mean, I remember one of the first singles I ever bought was Gaudete by Steel Ice Band. Oh yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was probably shunned by most serious folk. Yeah, absolutely. But, it was um, bu- you know, that was bubble gum for it, even though it was actually in Latin. <laughs> I, I, I went to a grammar school and I was invited to join the Morris dancing group that was a sort of, you know, post school group that had got together with a bunch of kids and the economics teacher. But I <laughs> didn't go the full bells. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't. I didn't do it. But but you yeah, joined the Morrissey dancing troupe instead, where you just had to wave tulips around. <laughs> <laughs> but you may hear later about my, you know, influences in the folk music. I'm sure. Uh, anyway, oh. yes. Yeah, so uh, let's get him on, Mr. Richard Thompson. Welcome to the Rock on Tours. Okay, guys, I'm ready. This was great, guys. I, I, it's so great to talk to two guys that have done this. Well, it's a big tune for sure. I actually wrote that originally for Tina Turner. Of course, I had gone and found Joni Mitchell down in Florida and brought her back. You know, what people forget about Bowie is that he was such a kind man. I've listened to a few of them and they've been really good, man. I'm sitting in the back of the car coming into London. They're brilliant. Remember me? I'm in a band now. <laughs> it's called Roxy Music. You know this thing about the 10,000 hours of experience? Oh, yeah. To, to get good at something. When we recorded Arnold Lane, we'd done about 50 hours. The Rock Hunters podcast with Gary Kemp and Guy Pratt. Hello, Gary. How you doing? <laughs> Hello, Hello, Richard. Hello. This is uh, nice. This is very nice. Looks very cosy where you are. Lots of posters. <laughs> cosy. Uh, it's, it's the sort of the junk room, really. Uh, we're, we're just redecorating... I've been uh, slapping a few coats on, and um, oh, you do it yourself? Of course, <laughs> proper bloke, you know. Have you moved back to London? Uh, I've always kept a place here, so um, you know the plan is to spend more time here now uh, because I, I sort of miss it, and I, and I, I love being here. So uh, I have to work in America, you know, quite a lot, but um, yeah. this always feels like home to me. Where was your pandemic though? Uh, mostly in New Jersey. Which is, uh, you know, big, not the most exciting place to be locked down, I suppose. But uh, one got by, one got by. Did it inspire any writing? I mean, it's, it's I can't think of it. It's a fantastic folky thing to write about. It's some great plague. Local. <laughs> 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 uh, well, yeah, I, I mean, I did a lot of writing. I, uh, nothing about lockdown at all. I, I, I just, uh, it, it's just a nice to be able to have uh, all that time, you know, with it without other things to distract you and uh i wrote a lot of stuff but it was mostly just coming out of my imagination it was nothing really about you know being in prison or anything you know or, or you know or <laughs> being in the middle of a, a sort of bubonic lockdown right. you, went to, you went to live in america quite a while ago now you sort of americanized yourself it's it's nice to have you back yeah. oh thank you very much thank you what part of london are you from Gary? I, I grew up in islington on essex road uh, oh, Essex Road, of course, yeah, yeah. I went to a school called Dame Alice Owens, which is the, you may have heard of, I don't know, it's the grammar school up at the Angel. I think we played you at rugby, did, didn't we? <laughs> <laughs> I definitely wasn't playing at rugby at any given time at that school. Well, I'm <laughs> doodling on my guitar. That would have been a bombshell. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, but basically I'm, I'm back, uh, I've got a place in Hampstead uh, that I've had for, uh, you know, before when it was affordable. Um about, about 35 years now so uh in spite of all my peregrinations um that this that does feel like uh like home and, and the book's been so well received i mean guy and i have loved it we've been talking yeah, about it. oh bless yeah. you thank you so much thank you I, I, you never thought probably when that young man was that shy young man was going to be talking about his life endlessly all these years later. <laughs> and is the reason for uh, that the fact that it sort of basically ends at 75, then we get this thumbnail sketch of everything since then. Does that mean there is going to be a volume two? Or Well, I really don't know. Um, I, you know, I stopped in 75 because musically I, I kind of stopped for a year uh, and I ran an antique shop. Um, uh, and, I love uh, that. It was hard to see, um, you know, where, where music was heading at that point. Um, you know, my my audience had kind of frittered away a bit, and uh, it wasn't until punk came along that, that you know that simultaneously helped to 
destroy the rest of my audience and and also inspire me to think i was gonna say that because that's something that comes up in your book which i thought was really nice which is that as opposed to a lot of your contemporaries even though because you were that sort of crucial few years younger but you, you know, saw punk as a thing of hope rather than well it was a re-energizing of, yeah. of, of the music scene i, I mean um you know, music in the seventies was, uh, you know, a lot, you know, sort of glam rock, um, uh, metal, uh, um, you know, uh, prog rock. You know, uh, none of which I really cared for, um, and I, I couldn't really see where I was going except maybe back to the folk clubs or something. Um, I, you know, I couldn't, couldn't see the future, but, but but punk was this real uh, reconnecting with the basic roots of rock and roll. You know, it was it was it was like. You know, Sun Records or, or something like that—a bit cruder, I suppose—but but it had the same energy. A very, you know. I mean, when you had the Clash doing the English Civil War, and you know, I mean, yeah, I mean, uh, fantastic. You know, then, then yeah, the the Pogues doing the, the kind of you know the right. folk version of punk. Um, so it was uh, for me, it was like a signpost really to to get back out there. Well, I, th I suppose there is a connection with folk in that it was you know English kids singing about political issues at their time about not having work. I mean, there was a sort of sense of post-industrial revolution lyrics. Abs yeah, absolutely. I think that's absolutely correct. And, and uh, I think music has always um, spoken to those issues, especially music uh, of the underclass, the working class, whatever you want to call it. So th that would have been called folk music, traditional music. Uh, and with punk, you know, it, it was the same thing. You know, it, it was supposedly working class kids uh, expressing you know, their frustration at, uh, you know, the world, you know, Thatcherite Britain. A lot, a lot of what you were saying earlier about music you didn't care for, actually, it's funny enough, punk is as well, had a theatrical element to it. Yeah. Mm. It's about the performance, which is something, you know, growing up, even though I, I loved your records, <laughs> I could see there was a complete shyness about, about, performance with with fairport and with the folk scene maybe maybe later with with, with steel i span there was an element of that mm. thrown in, which is kind of ironic isn't it because you know you think folk music you know with morris dancing and 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 that sort of dressing up that went on you've always shied away from the idea of a, a performance for you it's been about the music i think that came more out of uh, fairport but being a band around the uh, the London under underground scene, you know, the psychedelic scene in sort of sixty seven, where um, you know it, it wasn't that visual really. It, it was mostly about the music. You know, Pink Floyd at that point were just uh, you know a, a band of fairly faceless people, um, but be behind a light show, you know, behind all, all, all the bubbles and ripples of a light show. So. Uh, uh, you know, soft machine, you know, but people like that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Arthur Brown was more theatrical, but but you know, m most bands around that scene um, w would have said, uh, you know, it's a bit, a bit distasteful. You know, you're pushing yourself a bit too much if, if you if you have any kind of theatricality. And, and I mean, the re reality about traditional singers is um, that they were theatrical. You know, the, 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 they get up in the pub and 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 they that they use lots of gestures. You know, or, you know, they they kind of sell the song. In, in in that sense um so uh you know i think if we were shy then it's because we were shy people mm. um uh if we thought a bit more about it if we if we had a more of a visual sense then we, we, i think we would have um turned to that a bit more but i think i think we just passed us by really but it's funny because you talk about being shy before and you know that thing of being shy as a performer but mm. you're from listening to all your live stuff, and from when I saw you, I saw you at the Festival Hall, um, 2010. In fact, we briefly met backstage. Held down, yeah. Um, yeah, not, and, um, but, oh. and you are really, really particularly good at bantering with your audience. So you do um, actually really have that talent of connection. Yeah. Well, I, I, as soon as I started play, playing like solo acoustic, uh, mostly as, um, uh, as, as a way of paying the rent, actually, as a necessity. Uh, you know, and I, was, I was opening for bands like Crowded House, you know, um, on, on these huge North American tours. Uh, and Crowded House's audience were like 13, 14. I'm thinking, shit, <laughs> yeah, I'm going on like naked solo in front of all these kids, mostly girls, you know. Um, so I, I, th I thought, right, I'm, I'm going to attack the audience. I, I'm, I'm going to borrow, um, you know, the, the personas of a couple of musicians I know. I'll, I'll, I'll borrow Danny Thompson's persona. I'll borrow oh, right, Pat right. Donaldson's persona, you know, sort of loud, aggressive people. And I'll, I'll just harangue the audience. I'll, I'll just shout at them and I'll get on top of them. 
because uh, <laughs> otherwise I'm just going to die. And it actually worked. Um, so so I, I'd end up with getting some, some nice applause from these you know, 13-year-old girls. Thank you very much. And, um, <laughs> and it kind of stayed with me. And, and then um, I, I started to feel very comfortable on stage as a solo performer. And um, it, I found it very easy to, to, to have a kind of a dialogue with the audience uh, should that um, situation arise. Because there's some wonderful contradictions about your character, which we can get into later. Which, which you know, I see you as a <laughs> as a very joyful person. You know, when I've ever looked at interviews with you and and seen you on stage doing that, and yet lyrically you can go to the darkest places. I think any mm. British lyricist has been, yeah. and 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 I just you know that tug and pull of that is in, is interesting. But but we should go back, Richard, if you don't mind, to. Sure for the beginnings of your influences musically and and because it's it's so diverse much more diverse than most british rock players that we've spoken to mm. well you know you know i grew up in the house with uh you know my, my father's records which were mostly jazz and uh scottish music interesting combination right there um uh, and then my sister's records, uh, my, my sister was five years older than me uh, and she was getting into rock and roll from the very beginning. So, you know, Bill Haley was in the house and Elvis was in the house. And then lots of Buddy Holly, lots of Gene Vincent, lots of Jerry Lee. And uh, to me, that this was like an awakening. That This was music not just for teenage Brits, you know, who were rebelling against the the, uh, the kind of post-war depression almost. Um but, but but it really spoke to me as well as, as like a five and six year old. I, I thought this music is fantastic. You know, the, the, this this the energy. You know, the, the the message. You know, was so important. So I suppose um, I've ended up with this sort of synthesis of, of of musical styles. You know, that there's a bit of jazz in there. There's a bit of uh, uh, rock and roll. Now there's a bit a bit of uh, Scottish Celtic music in there. Too. Django. Yeah, Django's in there. You know, as, as well as you know Jimmy Shand and um, whoever you are as as a uh, instrumentalist. You, you know, you, you are that kind of sum total of your influences. And um, you, you know, for, for me, um, yeah, you know Django Reinhardt. You know, which is my father's music, really. Uh, Les Paul. You know, we're, we're never really on the front burner. It was just something in there, um, but but it wasn't that important. The important stuff was, was you know Hendrix or, or you know listening to, to you know the, the the birds or something but but I, I think it just crept in there and um you know that there, there is this synthesis of styles that, that um you know it, it's kind of unique to me and i think every every guitarist has their own uh unique synthesis you know bert yanch davy Graham, all, all these great acoustic players martin carthy you know will, will have their own unique uh, style and that it's, it's what makes them special. Your first electric guitar when you was a jazz guitar, wasn't it? You didn't go straight to like a Les Paul or pretty much, yeah. I, th yeah. I think, um, I, th I think I really liked um, the guitar player in, in Moby Grape, uh, Jerry Miller, who had a big jazz um, Gibson. And I thought, well, well that, that's pretty cool. Yes, he gets 175. A, he, yeah, he gets a great yeah. tone in you know, that guitar, so, so perhaps that's what I should be doing, but um. After a while, um, it became a bit unwieldy for for, uh, for rock music, really. And, and I realised that a lot of my heroes, my, my guitar heroes, were actually Fender players, you know, uh, people like Jimmy Bryant, um, James Burton, you know, where we're playing Fenders. I thought, well, mm -hmm. th th that should be what I'm doing. Your style with that flat picking, playing with the plectrum in, and, and your fingers, that yeah. you, you hit that right from the get-go, didn't you? That was... You know, what, uh, yeah, that, I think so. It, it's something that I, I really did unconsciously because I, I learned finger style. I learned classical finger style and also learned plectrum style. And I'd, I'd be sitting at home watching TV, you know, absentmindedly strumming away. And, and, and I realized um, that, that I was actually playing with my fingers and, and the thumb pick and the, the flat pick. I mean, sorry, at the same time. So and that just developed as a, as a thing without me thinking about it. It's weird. Um, it's just out of laz laziness, really. What, what you were saying about you know, that post-war generation and your, your, you know, your parents coming out of the war, you know, there was a sense of wanting order again in, 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 in life. I mean, I, I sort of witnessed this, I'm a, younger than you, but you know, mm. it was, they wanted to be together. They wanted, a, you know, everything to be formal and ordered. And that caused the spark of the revolution, didn't it really? I, th I think it really did. Yeah. Plus, um, you know, you, you had the impetus of of, uh, of of a boom generation. You know, the, the baby boomers. Uh, there were lots of them. You know, and culturally, they really mattered, and, and they continue to matter. I mean, right up to now, pretty much. You know, they've influenced musical taste, they've influenced artistic taste all, all the way. Yeah, now our parents went through a terrible time during World War Two, and 
you know, inevitably that they wanted to, to settle down after the war, you know, get, get a house, get, you know, raise a family, all that stuff. And, and you listen to, you know, the, to, to your parents' popular music from the, the early 50s or something, and it's all about, you know, um, 20 tiny fingers, 20 tiny toes, you know, those sort of songs, you know. It's about, about sort of raising a family. and, and uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but, but it's kind of bland music, you know, the sort of the, the Al McCogan generation, you know. Because, yeah, because you were in bands very, very young, weren't you? I think that's probably from about age of twelve, yeah. Um, with Hugh, Cor- with Hugh with Cornwell. Cornwell, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I mean, Hugh and I were great friends at school. You know, he, he um, you know, he wanted to to pl- to play an instrument, so I, so I taught him the bass. You know, and uh, we had our little trio at school with, with uh, Nick Jones, who was the son of Max Jones, the manager maker. But we had our little sort of power trio going, and that was great. And to, right up until. Um, I started playing with the Fairport guys at about sort of uh, 65, 66. Did you Is stay that... in touch with him after that or throughout? Did we, were you aware of I, I, I really didn't. Uh, he, he went off to Scandinavia, I think, um, uh, for, for a few years. And uh, I was busy on the road. I, I didn't run into him uh, for years and years and years. And then I think 40 years after our last conversation, I, I, I ran into him uh, at a festival in Spain. And, uh, oh, hi, there you are. <laughs> I mean, kind of you know picked up the conversation where we'd left it in 1967 um uh, and we've been in touch ever since which is great and he, he played at your 70th didn't he he did yeah, yeah. lovely we, that we, was a fantastic show but i've just been watching on youtube amazing that's hilarious well, well we, we, we did a great version of peaches just just for just for fun you know <laughs> you gathered at this house which was called fairport right in muswell hill yeah. Wait, has it got a blue plaque it hasn't because got a blue it really plaque, no. should have <laughs> uh, i went around there the other day and uh uh for this bbc thing you know and, and uh we knocked on the door and, and this guy says oh yeah you know a lot of people come around here asking about the house you know and he said uh you, you know he bought it uh, but probably just after we vacated actually and he's been there ever since and he said yes you know the, the original owner was a guy called dr monroe and, and i my, my heart sort of stopped because there was a ghost at the house uh called dr monroe Wow. You know, the, 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 he was like haunting the, the, the house still. How did you um, know his name? Uh, uh, someone else spoke to him. I, it wasn't me, oh, but, wow. but, but someone else who was staying in the house uh, spoke to this guy. And, and he, he, was, he was upset about the cat. Like he'd locked the cat in the cupboard or something. And, um, and the cat had died and, and he felt guilty about that. So someone should oh go my God, for eternity. <laughs> well, yeah, uh, or, or until someone goes in and exercises him, gives him a bit of peace and quiet. But um, that was uh, that was that's pretty interesting. <laughs> Muswell, Muswell Hill had a sort of a scene, didn't it? You know, with Kinks came from up there as yeah, well. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Did, yeah. Did, you know, did you bump into them? Was that? Was, well, well, it's, it's like that they'd already gone, but by the time that, that we were starting up, you know, um, I, I suppose uh, we used to go and see the Kinks uh, when they were called the Ravens. Oh, at wow. the youth local youth club um but really you know that they were you know a whole musical generation like like four years five years ahead of us um which is an eternity when you're that it, it's age, an eternity it? exactly <laughs> uh, so, so, so by the time we were gigging around uh the kings had really moved on and were you know a very successful pop group and, and were playing like big places you know and we were playing at uh, you know middle earth or something oh listen we, we have to talk about all that but, but but who did you want to be at that point what band were you aiming for because i mean obviously there's there's a, definitely a west coast americana that's Mm-mm. that's already in in your early music yeah who, uh, what was your ambitions um Probably to, to be a band uh, that that that, that uh, focus on lyrics. Um, we really love lyrics. Uh, you know, for us it was really important when, when Dylan went electric. Um, uh, you know, the, the the birds recording Mr. Tambourine Man, the bells of Rimney, um, things like that. Um, we thought this is what we want to do. So we would uh, cover songs by uh, the great singer songwriters. Really, and at that time that was Richard Freenia, Phil Oaks. Hmm. Uh, early Joni Mitchell, we got hold of her, her acetates. Um, uh, the Dylan basement tapes, we got hold of those. I think we we were first to the. Uh, yeah, that's quite amazing to get hold of, to to get hold of that stuff. <laughs> How? Yeah. Uh, well, well, we phoned up Dylan's publisher, man. We said, "Have you got any unpublished Dylan songs?" He said, "Oh yeah, yeah, come on over." <laughs> and and they, they gave us this pile of, of like twelve um, twelve acetates of of uh, the basement tapes. And we did the same thing with Joni Mitchell. Before she'd made a record, uh, we got hold of her her demos from her publisher. We, we, we just phoned them up. It was easy. Just jumping ahead. That, that shows actually great kind of 
sort of initiative, though. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. You looked in, uh, didn't you have a little sneak into Joni Mitchell's lyric book? one point oh, yeah well i did yeah uh we we did a show with with joni at the the festival hall when she was opening for us i'm sure that never happened again um and <laughs> uh, and uh well, well while she was on the stage you know i, I was walking past the, her dressing room and i and i just saw her notebook like lying there. i thought just have a little just have a little peek because I, I i was really interested in um other people's process you know um you know how writers write. You know, and it's something where you wrote, wrote standing up at the typewriter. You know, that, that kind of thing. That's that's what stuff really intrigues me. And so I, I just thought I'd, I'd get some insight into her process. Um, and I suppose I did. I, I just thought that that um, she was obviously like, like a very strong visual artist as well as as a musical artist, and 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 you could really see that in in her, in her writing and her doodles and and stuff. Like just looking oh. at, looking at a page of of, uh, of what she did was. Uh, Extraordinarily interesting, actually. Yeah. Oh, of course, now you've just been able to get a picture on your phone. <laughs> Probably. Yeah. <laughs> no, terrible thing, terrible thing. Sorry, I would never, <laughs> never. <laughs> but, but covers, covers were really where you were at that time then, wasn't it? You weren't, you seeing yourself as a songwriter with Richard at that point. No, I, I mean, uh, if we're talking 67, then we were a covers band um, to the point where um, we, we thought, um, shit uh we need to write some songs because uh we noticed um that in order to have credibility with the audience you had to be writing at that point i mean you know thanks to the beatles i think more than anything else yeah. the beatles really changed the landscape uh it used to be you know that the writers wrote for, for the for the artists you know and the artists would perform it was a separate thing uh, in many cases but, but when the Beatles came along, they, they 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 did everything themselves. So you know the Stones had to start writing, uh, and all the other bands had to start writing their own stuff. So um, you know by '68, by our second album, we were pretty much writing uh, at least half our albums at that point. Um, and uh, and I suppose we didn't look back. Now there's something about these first two albums. I want to which listening to them because I think with the gigs you were playing, hmm. was your audience you were you were playing folk clubs and stuff as well, weren't you? as well as just um, a sort of straight yeah yeah I, I mean but probably but by 67 when we got an agent we, we were just doing rock gigs but but certainly you know proto fairport you know fairport before it was called fairport where, where we did uh, a lot of folk clubs you know, folk but, clubs blues clubs i mean everything because because uh, the thing is those first two hours especially the first one listening mm. to it now with, with all the with and with everything else that was happening at the time they sound so incredibly mature and assured and beautifully right. recorded amazingly recorded for the time, I mean, they're, they're, sound, they're sonically fantastic. And I just wondered if, 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 if you'd been playing to more of a folky audience, so rather than kind of manic pill-popping mods or screaming girls, <laughs> that kind of, that, that gave you that more level approach to recording. Because, you, you know, it, it sounds like it's like your sixth album or something. Um, anyway. If I listen to the first album, it sounds to me all over the place, you know, stylistically. You know, there are so many threads, mm. there are so many influences that, that it's almost too much. Uh, um, and by the second album, we're starting to iron that out a bit uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a better uh, way. Um, I, I, I don't, um, yeah, I, I suppose, um, you know, the, I mean, the, the recording quality is down to John Wood, who is a wonderful engineer and, and a great yeah, who studio stayed with you for so long didn't he? you 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 yeah, yeah, I, mean, yeah, with him I, I, I mean he was the best you know and and, and sound techniques was a, is a really wonderful studio and they also built their own mixing desks so, so you had this really unique sound and um uh, you know the mixing desks are, are changing hands for lots of money these days mm -hmm. you know an, an original sound techniques desk you should talk about joe boyd really who's involved yeah. with this period and which season and you know it's funny enough because i'm reading your book it it rem obviously it's all tied in, but it reminded me because it deals in a particular corner of the music industry, which we're not always looking at. Yeah. Um, and, and white, white bicycle, I think was, was Joe's book. I'm, I'm yeah. A, mm -hmm. yeah which I also, you know, really enjoy. So we've got the incredible string band. You've got mm -hmm. um, Nick Drake and this little cohort and pe gr a group of people that he's beginning to form. But also let's talk about him as, you know, this is the, the kid who fronted the UFO club and in, and help invent Pink Floyd and psychedelia. So just, just describe what's going on with Joe Boyd and your, and that world. Yeah. Uh, 
Joe was someone who always seemed to be in the right place at the right time, uh, musically speaking. Uh, um, when, when he was at Harvard, uh, he was booking people like Lonnie Johnson, um, mm-hmm. you know, uh, Mississippi, Fred McDowell. He was bringing these blues artists up from Mississippi on the train, you know, uh, to, 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 to play at Harvard. I mean, it was just ridiculous. Uh, he, he was the stage manager when um, the Dylan went electric at Newport. Um, I didn't know that. That's yeah, yeah. No, I didn't know that. <laughs> Uh, he was um, he, he was uh, head of Electra in the UK. This is when he's like twenty three years old, which is pretty good. Um, so, so he's r- r- running Electra, and, and he's he's recording the incredible string band for Electra. He's telling Electra, "You should really sign this band called Pink Floyd. You should really sign this band called The Move." Electra saying, "No, I don't think so. No, we don't want to." Um, their loss, I think. Um, <laughs> and uh, Joe, you know, w- was probably, you know, the only person in London who would, would have had the ears to, to really uh, understand what, what Fairport were trying to do uh, and what the Incredible String Band were trying to do. I mean, who else would have signed the Incredible String Band? Yeah, they sound uh, like an impossible proposition, to the amount of people and... <laughs> they absolutely, well, it's, it's basically two of them, you know, plus right. two, two girlfriends who play, you know, anything from bass to finger cymbals and... Um, and then they added dancers and it all got a bit out of control. The best, the best album front cover, I've, I think, in the history of album front covers is that group of weirdos that <laughs> sing on the front <laughs> Which, in a way, I think you tried to slightly emulate in that gatefold of the um, of, with uh, the album after Legion Leaf. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, oh, no, no. Sorry, after, uh, no, yes, sorry. sorry. Uh, I was the wrong way around. Yeah, and, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, but it, that that scene looked looked incredible you know, at that time. Well, it's it's very much of its time, isn't it? I mean, it's a you know, absolute bunch of uh, of hippies, and, and uh, yeah, yeah, the Incredibles li- lived up in Edinburgh in this sort of almost like communal uh, uh, existence, um, and it was really uh, a strange world up there, you know. But the UFO Club, just you know, that's Book Club, yeah. I, um, I don't, I don't know where I'm connecting what Sid's doing uh, lyrically and 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 vocally with you guys who are doing, you know, a, a more Americana. But it all seemed to work in the pot at UFO. Uh, you, yeah, I mean, UFO, you, you had all the psychedelic bands. Yeah, you know, Family were a great band. Uh, Blossom oh, Flowers fam- were, were great, great band. band. Um, and and Pink Floyd were basically the house band at, at, at the UFO Club. Oh. Uh, um, and uh, what well, one of Fairport's early gigs? I mean, we'd only been in existence a couple of months. Uh, we're still open for, for Pink Floyd, but that was the night that that, that Sid pretty much left the band uh, and the planet. I think that your memory is either incredible or you have diaries from all that period because some of the list of gigs and what went on is is so detailed. What, what, what was or it? you've just taken your brilliant storytelling abilities from your songs and applied them to your life. And I'm making it all up. Could <laughs> yeah. be. Um, no, I, I mean, my, my memory is very selective. I mean, some stuff, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm sure, you, you know, you, you might be the same, but you remember really, really clearly. Yeah, uh, and other stuff it is a blank, uh, and I, I I can compare notes with old band members from the sixties and say, do you remember this? And they'll say no, and they'll say, do you remember this? And I'll say no. <laughs> so so yeah, really selective. So, so um, the the book would have been three times longer if I could remember everything. I, I did not keep diaries or journals. Alas, I wish to God I had. It would have made it so much easier. So I had to rely on on uh, you know websites that claim to have every. Fairport gig that ever happened, you know, um, claim to have, you know, my, my old agents' books and stuff, um, but but they're also incomplete. I mean, so um, it took a lot of uh, gluing it all together. But do you find that because I we've all written books here, so uh, well, but do you probably. find there's a thing of where you're convinced that like you know yeah this was in Belgium on that week and then you're told that it wasn't. <laughs> you're like, yeah, oh, um, I'm sure. That- I, I, I mean, I found this all the time, actually, um, mm-hmm. that the, the people remembered different things very differently. And I, I think you just have to trust your own uh, uh, memory, really. Um, I, I'm pretty sure I'm right about most things. <laughs> 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 I just I just um, I love this little shift that goes for where where youth culture, pop culture goes from UFO to Middle Earth. And there is a there is a kind of glim- I know Middle Earth is kind of known now as being the sort of birth of glam rock in a way. Yeah. But, you know, but Bowie was there and and, 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 and T-Rex. Mm. And actually, if you look at that early Tyrannosaurus Rex, it's a, it's a guy singing with an English accent yeah. in a mystical way that has a spirituality about it that is kind of folky. They're sitting on the floor. Yeah. So there yeah. was there was this diversion at that point then where some people some people went glam rock and others stayed in folk. I think Mark Bolan was always um, 
you know, more in the pop world almost. I, I think he was a prime director. Uh, you know, John's Children, uh, which was his band, right. I think, mm. before T-Rex, you, you know, we're, we're more like a pop band. Uh, T-Rex might have been just a, economics where he said, okay, well, I'm just going to, you know, two of us will play acoustic uh, and we'll earn some money for a change. Um, yeah, that, that may have been the motivation. I don't know. But, but um, He was a mod. He would have been into show. Yeah, yeah. I, I, but you know, the, the, I, I thought they were charming. You know, uh, yeah, I, I really liked him as a human being. I, I thought he was just, just a really nice guy. You know, just a nice human being. Um, and it, it was tragic uh, to hear that he'd been killed. It really, really broke my heart. Because one band that seems to come up a lot in your book, which I never really thought of as being, is the Social Deviants. <laughs> that that was Mick Brown, wasn't it? Yeah, um, yeah. Well, you know, they were always around, and I think because they were very politically motivated, um, they'd be everywhere. You know, they'd be at all gigs, they'd be at all benefits. Um, uh, you know, you'd see them all over the place. And they were a very uh, confrontational band. They were kind of a, punk, for a sort of MC5 vibe. Exactly, yeah. Um, <laughs> It was kind of you know you know screw you screw the audience screw everybody um, you know we're up here making a statement. Um, they were punk before punk. Um, yeah, in a sense they were, except that I, I think punk communicated something a, a bit clearer. Um, I, and I think the deviants, uh, were, as performers, the, the message got got a bit scrambled. You know. Um, let's, yeah. let's 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 talk about you know you, you, your second album, you, you know, the holidays album, and you writing. Mm -hmm suddenly writing this how old are you now you're only sort of 17 18 19 19 okay. write me on the ledge which is still yeah, yeah. to this day the fairport anthem it's still sung by thousands of people every year when they can go to festivals that's true uh, yeah. what, you know what brought that up? it's one of the first songs you ever wrote isn't it well i think it's the first thing i ever wrote solo um you know i'd done i've probably done written half a dozen songs as collaborations before that um you know i was just write, writing you know uh something without thinking too much about what I was writing. Um, I could interpret it now in various ways, but, but at the time I, I was just, uh, you know, stringing words together that, that, that sounded good, but, but there's obviously, you know, uh, uh, there, there's some purpose behind the song. Um, uh, but as you say, I mean, people now sing it in this sort of anthemic way uh, and it, 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 it's not my property anymore. It becomes somebody else's. I, I, I'm sure yeah, you've had this, the same feeling, Gary, where, where a song kind of goes out there and, and it's just, you don't own it anymore. You know, pe people take it over and uh, and it's out there in the world. And if you wanted to change verse three, you know, it's, it's too late. It's gone. <laughs> yeah, but I think I think actually what, what has made that song such a success is it is its ambiguity. You know, people yeah. sing the funeral because yeah. they think, oh, you know, meet on the ledge is actually this place in heaven that we're all going to suddenly get back together again. But it's a sense, it's me on the ledge doesn't really mean, it can mean a different thing to different people. It's about unity. It's about coming together as a group of people. You yeah. know, we had um, Noel Gallagher on, and I think actually it's it's Wonderwall. Wonderwall doesn't mean anything e either. <laughs> but it, it's a sense, you know, people all sing it together because you're my Wonderwall, you yeah, know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> me on the ledge. That's part of the beauty of, of songs sometimes is then they don't yeah. have to be totally detailed. They need to have that ambiguity of spirituality. Well, I think absolutely. I, you know, it, it's the kind of the, it's the poetical end of songwriting, if, if you like, that, that that you can use language in a way that goes beyond logic. You know, it, it, and it goes beyond meaning, uh, and 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 that's the whole idea. Uh, uh, so, uh, it, it's great that that particular song uh, can be so open to interpretation. Yeah. Can we talk about just meeting Sandy Denny? Because that was such a yes, a massive moment. She, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and, and who who was she? Because you know she's so iconic now. Um, wow. Um, well, she, she had a reputation on the folk scene as being this up and coming, you know, singer songwriter. And uh, when uh, uh, Judy l left Fairport, uh, we said, well, well um, you know, let, let's audition people, you know. And Sandy was on on the list. She was about number three or four on the list, and. Uh, uh, after after a couple of not very impressive um, uh, auditioners, uh, you know, she, she came in and just you know um, lifted the roof off. I mean, she was such a, a great singer, um, in so many ways a great singer. Uh, um, you know, great emotion in her voice, uh, slightly elusive quality to to, to, to a song. Um, she could she could interpret a song very quickly. She could just nail a song, uh, the, the intention of a song. Um, 
Uh, yeah, one of the, one of the greatest singers I've ever heard, really. And she uh, she auditioned you as well, didn't she? Um, well, fair enough. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, fair enough. Yeah. Um, I I think you know because she was joining a band, she wanted to see, you know, the value of of, of our music, uh, see if there's something that she liked about us. So uh, it was a kind of a mutual audition in the end. Yeah, that that was great. Um, but but she she, she was um, you know, fantastic musician, great songwriter, um, very original songwriter. And, um, you know, a bundle of contradictions as a human being, you know, like a bundle of nerves and, and you know, confident and not confident. Um, you, you know, um, some men like went nuts over her, but but she didn't want those. She wanted the other ones, you know, it's just a, a, a real mixture, a real mixture. God bless her. <laughs> yeah, because what she brought in was a more English folk and. Uh, or, and or British folk, yeah. And so that that Unhalf Bricking album that sort of kind of goes for two ways. I mean, I know there's people fight all the time. You know, Legion leave Unhalf Bricking. That's the best one. This is the best one. <laughs> but I think there's still for me there's 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 um, that you're not quite clear on which direction you're about to go in at this point. You're still mm-hmm. half in Dylan's world and and half in this old pre-industrial revolution world. You know that the, the Brit- yeah. yeah. Yeah, uh, um, she brings that in, does she? Is, is, is it her gift? Uh, you know, well, uh, well, we'd always played in folk clubs that we always, you know, it's, uh, you know, messed around a little bit with uh, British traditional music, so, so it wasn't alien to us. Uh, but when Sandy came in the band, um, we didn't have a lot of rehearsal time, so you know, she was trying to learn our, our, our repertoire, and we thought, well, we should learn some of hers, um, and then you know, we'll have enough for a set. And so uh, we kind of wrap ourselves around, um, you know, she moved through the fair, um, the things like that, Nottingham Town. Um, and, you know, at some point on the Legion Leaf album, uh, we're sitting backstage, you know, just messing around and Sandy starts singing A Sailor's Life, um, of which I think she'd learned from Martin Carthy. And uh, we said, well, that, that, that's a great song. You know, we could really do a nice arrangement of that, you know, because it's very droney. We can put a drone under it. Uh, and we can play something instrumental on it. So we we we, we said, well, well let, let's just play it tonight without any rehearsal. We'll just get up on stage and, and we'll do it. And so we did that, and we thought, well, that that went very well. Let's record it. And we recorded it in one take. And and it's a kind of a magical take. It's one of those really l- lucky things that happens in the studio sometimes, where everything just clicks, and, and there are surprises for the people playing. You know, not not just for the listeners, but as we're playing it, we we we're, we're, we're surprising ourselves all the time we're thinking well that, that didn't happen before where did that come from you know well all these little things keep kicking in um and to me it's, it's a re- really you know, it, just just a magical track that, that really cemented for us the the idea that this should be the direction that fairport goes in and it's just a timeless track as well because it, you know it doesn't sort of sit into oh that's very sounds very late 60s it doesn't have, <laughs> you can say that now it's it has a modernity about it because of the drone i think the whole on. period yeah those albums have dated fantastic well i must be i've been lost in legion leaf for the last couple of weeks and i've forgotten so it is a masterpiece it's incredible well, uh, well <laughs> mm, i don't know as... about that but anyway thank you okay you have you have your ambivalent um Oh gosh, yeah. With, with uh, albums I've been involved in, always, yeah. Uh, because um, there's things um, you think, well, we could have done that a bit better. Could, could have, you know, well, why did so and so do that there? You know, but there's little things. I mean, I, you know, I like the records generally overall, but but I'm, I, I go more song by song. I, you know, on, on half breaking, I, I think of almost like a like a, a three or four track album. You know, there, there are tracks on it that I, I could happily lose. They're almost like throwaway tracks, but there's absolutely great tracks on it. I, I think it's, I think it's a four track. LP in, in that sense. Um, An EP. Uh, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. It would have been a, a monumental EP. And uh, Legion Leaf, you know, I, I, you know, I think, well, well, what if we'd done this song instead of that song? You know, there are things where I think we went kind of overboard on, on, on the really big ballads. Um, we should have done oh, right. smaller songs as well. I, I mean, <laughs> Legion Leaf should have been a double album, really, um, because I think we had that much material. I wish it was. That's it. Yeah. Are there tapes? <laughs> Are there tapes? Nothing. No, zero. No. <laughs> it's one of the most terrific parts in the book. And God, I mean, you write, it's written like it's like Ian McEwan has made it up in a novel, but it is, you know, you finished on half bricking in, in the studio and you're doing, still doing gigs and you come back from Birmingham one night where mm. I can't remember where you were. Um, uh, and, 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 and this crash occurs. And the way it's described in the book, it's phenomenal. I mean, it's, you know, with your girlfriend and you were sitting, you know, do you, could, do you mind describing what, what, 
how, what happened to you? Yeah, sure. I, I mean, I really described it as it happened. I, I didn't really add or take anything away. That, that, that I, I just tried to put in every, everything that I thought was pertinent, um, everything I could remember. Um, you know, you know. Well, once the crash happened, I, I was in and out of consciousness um, a fair bit. So, so there are things that, that I was not aware of. Um, and uh, you, you know, it, it's this in incredibly traumatic incident that, that really just about destroys the band. I mean, not quite, but almost completely destroys us. Um, you know, my girlfriend's killed, uh, our drummer's killed, and we don't really know um, how, how we're going to carry on, how we're going to get the spirit to carry on. Um, so you were sitting in the front seat, right? Yeah, yeah, I, I was in the front seat. Uh, I think I was the only only one actually awake in, in in the van, including the driver. The driver was asleep as well. So, um, and people you know, just didn't um, wear seat belts as a rule, did you? No, did you? no, no, nobody, nobody wore seat belts. So uh, you know, it took it took us a long time to to recover from that. I, I mean, in in the true, you know, mental sense, I think it, it took us years um, to really to, to get over the trauma. And and you know, the, the, you you didn't go to therapy in those days. There was none of that stuff. Yeah, it, it was it was it was kind of post World War Two, where you know, yes, you've been through this thing, but you know, stiff up a lip, you know, carry on, chaps, you know, and and it, it'll all be okay. Um, but we weren't okay. We were kind of broken, really. Well, just um, just getting in a van again, I would have thought was. It was it was really uh, difficult uh, to, to to just uh, to get in a van and drive down the road. It was very hard. Yeah. And you must think of Martin, you know, uh, quite often, really. You know, he's, he's there on the records. He's there in film. Uh, and uh, and, I, and I'm so delighted that that, that people you know ha have that um, a, ability to to see Martin, you know, and hear hear Martin play. I mean, that that's his legacy. Uh, is is the three albums that he made with Fairport and uh you know he was a wonderful human being and a great drummer and um it's it's just uh, heartbreaking that that, that that someone like that should, should be taken away so young I wouldn't mind batting around a bit this um kind of folk revival that happened because it's so important and, and I just just put in my own personal two pen thing you may not realize it from the kind of music I ended up making but it meant <laughs> a lot to me in the in, a, in a certain period in my life 1974 mm. I went to a club quite often every week called the Florence it was a pub in off of Upper Street mm. and you went upstairs and you you saw people with their fingers in their ears you you know you saw people with accordions and mm. and um and I listened to English folk music and, and I found this book today this I stole from my school library it's the Oxford Book of Ballads oh wow there's oh, yeah. Owen's school library I'm going to get done for this they're going to get in touch with me <laughs> and, and, I, and one of the first things I did as a songwriter as a kid was set these ballads to music wow. and I had no idea what the music was I didn't read music so um and you know in here I I, I noticed this morning and I remember when when Legion Leaf came out this Tam Lin is in here and mm -hmm. Patrick Spence is in here yeah. and it was there was something going on in the air at that time what was it well was <laughs> well there have been cycles of, of of revivals of British folk music you know it's started starting with the Victorians with like Cecil Sharp and 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 uh yeah. And, and people like Vaughan Williams are uh, going out in the field because they really thought industrialization was going to kill folk music or, or it was going to kill that whole rural way of life. So they were the first ones. Then you had in the 50s, you had, you had uh, Ewan McCall and A.L. Lloyd well, with, with the Ballad and Blues Club um, doing the, you know, the, the kind of more, of the, you know, specialized um, um, arrangements and, and things of, of traditional song. But, but again, you know, people were out in the fields collecting. Again, they thought it was going like to die Lomax. out. Yeah, like Lomax and Shirley Collins were yeah. out in the field. Uh, and Fairport were almost part of the third revival, that, like the folk rock thing, where we, which was bringing um, traditional music in, into the popular arena, you know, with electric guitars, drums, all that kind of stuff. Um, and, uh, you know, a constant through all that was probably, you know, you know the folk clubs, which re really got rolling in, in, in the early 50s. Um, Probably in the sixties, there were you know at least three hundred, maybe six, maybe six hundred folk clubs. Um, but there was a certain amount of politics behind it, I guess, as well. It was yeah, about it, working people, wasn't it? It, it was, yeah. Um, there was a very socialist sort of attitude to folk clubs. Uh, if you were the performer, um, you, you were kind of not treated as anything special. You know, you you were just what, 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 you just what, one of the crowd. You know, who happens to sing. Similar to, similar to in the way that the trad jazz scene was very political, wasn't it? And 
I suppose I think the folk scene was more political than, than okay. the, the trad jazz scene. Actually, uh, yeah, um, it, it was there was it was a real um, you know socialist slash communist uh, undertone to, to, to the whole thing, uh, and, and that was the motivation for a lot of songwriters. And people saw traditional music as, as reflecting, you know, real working class, class values. Um, you know, in some cases, true; in some cases, misguidedly. Um, but but, but it, it was it was a it was a big thing that was an undercurrent, really, uh, that that ran all through the sixties and seventies. Uh, I mean, they're still going, of course. Uh, it's less political these days, of course. And, and there are all, all types of folk clubs. You have folk clubs that, that were much more singer songwriter. Yeah, you, you had real hardcore traditional folk clubs uh, like the Singers Club in Hull, where you you couldn't take in a musical instrument. Just yeah, your yeah. finger yeah. to put in your ear. Yeah, that, that's it. Yeah, this 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 was your <laughs> this is your your instrument. <laughs> Uh, but but it, um, you know it, it's been a sort of a nurturing place for, for so many people as well. You know it, it was a great place to, to get up for the first time in front of an audience, you know, uh, and sing. So, so people got nurtured in that way. It was, it was a great place for, for people like Billy Connolly, you know, Jasper Carrot, you know, to, to, to get started uh, on a sort of show business career. Because in fact, didn't you play? Well, we're talking of open mic nights. Didn't you do the legendary open mic night in um, LA at the Whiskey? Uh, the yes. troubadour, the troubadour. Yeah, the, the troubadour. Yeah, um, I, th- I think we did a few of those actually uh, over the years. Yeah, uh, we, which was extraordinary. You, you'd see people like you know Peter Talk for, from the Monkees. You know, we, we, we'd do a song, and uh, Linda Ronstadt would get up and do a song, and, and uh, you know, it was, it was uh, yeah, but, but pretty amazing. Um, sort of a high powered <laughs> kind of open mic night uh, at the troubadour in those days. Um, yeah, Gene Clark might get up and do a song. You know, it's just uh, right. extraordinary. Yeah. But there was, I mean, there's obviously a massive contradictions in there. Obviously, you've got you've got people with political ideals that are singing yeah. about people in fields pre-industrial revolution. <laughs> kind of, yeah, really, and and also, you know, dare I say it, it was quite middle class to to a, certainly in London. What I was, yeah, absolutely was. But yeah. but with Legion Leaf, do you think you were trying to invent a genre that would stop us all looking to America uh, for for our music? That, I think that was the idea. That was absolutely the idea. Um, you know, we were a very idealistic band, a very thoughtful band, um, and we were a bunch of, of you know middle class intellectuals, really, when it comes down to it. But but, but we really thought it was time that that, uh, that, that that there was this kind of British popular music. You know, the the, the Kings had kind of gone halfway there. You know, the, the Beatles to some extent had, 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 had got, got, got a bit in that direction as well. But um, it, it, it was time to really make a statement, which the Legion Leaf album was. And um, that statement w- was echoed by bands in Scandinavia, bands in Holland, um, bands in Spain, you know, who, who did the same thing with, with their tradition. So uh, it was a very influential record. But also because basically the whole folk rock movement in Britain spread out from Fairport Convention, didn't it? It was like all the players who sort of started those. Pentangle. Like, yeah, pen- all kind of came from you. <clears throat> Well, I think so, yeah, and, nice and, band, and, but, you know. and I think because it was um, quite a small scene and a bit disconnected from the, the mainstream of popular music, um, you'd find yourself in, in a band with the same people over and over again, you know, like you'd leave mm-hmm. one band and, and, you, and you, you'd, you'd be in one of the other four bands, you know, there, there weren't that many, so you kind of, uh, you know, revolve through the, the, whole, the whole scene sometimes. And you've, I've ended up with one of the most sort of enduring festivals there is you know with crop oh, really? yeah yeah it was extraordinary um yeah i mean they, they get you know twenty thousand people on, on, on a good year and and you know have been going for you know years and years and years and years and years yeah uh, it was a terrifying musical experience of my life at crop ready <laughs> what what was that i had to get up having never been in a room with let alone rehearsed with the blockheads in front of twenty thousand people and play hit me with your rhythm stick which is the most difficult thing i've ever played in my life uh, and I can tricky. say thank God for a folk audience because they were wonderful. <laughs> Forgiving. It's, yes. it's, it's tricky if, you, if you're the bass player. You know, yeah. Uh, Richard, it seems to me that that crash kind of kept on reverberating because you now make this incredible album, but people start to leave. You know, Sandy leaves and mm. If, mm. eventually you leave. Um, I mean, now you've got Swarbrick and you've, you've got the, you're doing this electric jig stuff, which no one has ever done, reels and jigs and super yeah. fast stuff. I mean, unbelievable. But it still feels like the crash is still reverberating. Yeah, I, I think it affected our decision making a, a lot, you know. Um, yeah, well, I think we're, we're in, in some kind of, of disarray, really. I, I don't think... Uh, 
that, that Sandy would have left. I don't think Ashley would, would have left the band uh, if it hadn't been for for the, for the accident, really. Um, and and uh, I think I think for a couple of years where we, we were still, you know, not not thinking straight. But going um, solo was important to you. Well, I think it was. You know, you know, I've been in bands for a long time. I've been in bands since I was twelve, and and I think I was just burnt out with the whole band idea. And I wanted to get away. I think just to write. Um, and you know, I left Fairport. I, I did a year just as a session guitar player. Really, um, played in Sandy's band a bit. Played in Ian's band, mm -hmm. but that, that left me plenty of time to write. And uh, you know, I wrote the songs that ended up on on my on my first solo record. Because you were a massive session player. When you did a lot of sessions, you. Yeah, lots and lots and lots. Um, yeah, but yeah. um, but then, yeah, what's it? Uh, Henry the Human Fly, right? That's the one yeah, that's, that's the next but that, record, so, yeah. which is a persona that you came up with when you were in Fairport. Or was, um, it was just a gag at the start of a show. It was, it was a sort of a gag. Uh, apparently, I, I I made an entrance like, like you know where, where, where I I swung in on a rope on on the stage in in a in a in a, in a superhero costume, and um. <laughs> Oh, this was <laughs> of which I remember absolutely nothing, as 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 happens sometimes. Um, mm -hmm. But um, you, you know the the, the, the you know the, the guys from Fairport still call me Henry. They, they don't call me Richard. Oh my god! Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> it's it, it. I just wanted to get back to one story that 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 made me smile in the book, and it kind of sums up all of you guys and 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 maybe your shyness really richard is mm -hmm. that when 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 mccartney invites you to his birthday oh yeah <laughs> and you turn it down yeah i know i know and I, if, if i could have take two on that one I, I think i'd go um yeah i don't know what i was thinking i i, I think i thought the beatles were, were a bit too pop you know and, and and i was obviously a bit of a snob musically um so I thought, well, you know, it's only, it's only Paul McCartney. You know, if, if it was, you know, if it, if it was Dylan, I'd go. You know, if it was some, you know, more of a wordy singer songwriter, I, I, I'd probably go. But uh, why were you invited? <laughs> I don't know. You're, I, you're I, still I, quite, yeah. quite very cult at this point, weren't you? Um, I got invited. Sandy got invited, and, and no one else in the band. I, I think that they were. That's even worse. <laughs> yeah, that's, that is even worse, isn't it? Um, I, I think that there must have been, been, you know, going through a list of, of, you know, sort of who's who or who isn't on the <laughs> or, you, you, on the London scene. You may have been a snob, but I, I see it more as being fearful of celebrity. Probably also true. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. What happens to you now is is and it's it's is you you find the Sufi form of of, of Hindu of, of Islam, right? Islam. Yeah. You you find that, and you you meet Linda. That's really changed your life. I mean, you'll take it. You, you're you, you still um, are you yeah, a yeah. Sufi, Richard? Yes, I am. Yeah, I, I still do all, all that stuff. Yeah. For me, looking at the music business, I, I see these kind of forks in the road where, where you say, "Okay, I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna die of an overdose if I go this way," mm -hmm. or, or I, I clean up completely and, and I get some some spiritual value in my life. You know. So for me, it, it was that kind of choice. The kind of stark thing. Being part of this, you know, you're trying to process all this, and suddenly you have some clarity here. You have order because that's what religion gives you. Yeah, yeah. It, yeah. Where, you know, music business is completely disordered. Yeah, yeah I, I think I, I think I, I needed some kind of um, way to steer through, you know, the shark infested waters of the, of the music business, if you like. You know, yeah, clarity is a, is, is a good way of putting it. But you know, I wanted. Um, like so some connection with the universe I, I i wanted to know where i was in it what my place in it was yeah i know i've heard you say this about all music being spiritual and i'm trying to just get the definition of that word because the cynic in me is pulling it down mm. um and i want to believe that and i know as a writer and as a singer when when i'm in immersed in a song i'm i'm not in this room you know yeah, absolutely yeah, yeah. It, it, is that sort of what you mean it's about finding a higher self i think so yeah and i think the way you find a higher self is by losing yourself you know so when you lose yourself in music you become part of this greater thing this sort of semi-conscious part of this greater thing your ego gets suppressed a bit somehow and and uh, and you kind of open up and and, and you, you feel all these connections you know how do you describe music music's so elusive you know you you can't grasp it you can't get hold of it yeah you you, you can't paint it you, you you can't you know stick it in a box or something yeah you can't, can't hold it. it in your hand mm -hmm. um it's this stuff that is kind of out there and drifting around and, and uh you know it, it, in in that way it, it's the closest to, to um to escaping you know the earth if you like you know escaping earth the earth and earthly values what do you think the secret is to the, the that album you made with 
Linda, you know, uh, I want to see the bright lights. I mean, is that what is what is it that makes that? Because I love that album. You know, yeah. it's always in people's, often in people's top ten best albums. Mm. What, what's, um. I don't know. I think sometimes you just get lucky. I, I think that's all it is. You, you know, sometimes that you know the stars line up and and, and you, you go in the studio and everything works and um, you know the the, the tracks go down easily. Um, you know, you, you know, you're not struggling for, for days to 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 to, to get you know, a good rhythm track or something. Everything just worked the first time, and I, I think the songs were were good. Um, he said modestly, and I think the the, uh, the the performances are good, um, and everything we tried worked. You know, all, all the people that we, we brought into the record, you know, like Crumhorn players, and and, and you know, the, and the, the silver the, band. You said because you the this, in the book band, you yeah. say silver band rather than brass band. Yeah, um, I mean, it's, it's a minor distinction, but but um, you, you know, you know, they, they usually call um, you know, like works bands, like colliery bands mm. or, or steel works bands, are usually silver bands because they're playing, you know, silver instruments rather than right. brass instruments. Um, but that has you know, a mournful sound to that as well, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah there's this real mournful, nostalgic sound, sound to it, which is kind of wonderful. Um, Although actually, on that song, it's actually very bright and up sounding. That band, it, it, it's yeah, not it's, the it's, downest one associates with a brass band, you know. It's bright and up sounding with with a tinge of melancholy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, you know, in a way, I hate to say this because this sounds flippant, but um, that you were kind of the, uh, the the Lindsay and Stevie of uh, of England, weren't you? <laughs> at that point, there was, and oh, I mean that in a good way. I mean, there no, was that's a brilliant. That's brilliant on the record, and I think having a glimpse into the relationship made it made it real. You know, the, 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 yeah. Um... Well, it's, course, it's a yeah. I mean, it's funny because you, you don't necessarily think you're writing songs about about your relationship, especially mm -hmm. if you're a, a performing couple. You know, because uh, that would be too naked and and too too uh, self conscious, really. So, so you, you just write these songs and you think, oh, that that's a kind of love song. You know, it's a, that's a song of loss. You know, blah blah blah. But you don't you don't think it's about you. So. so um, uh, yeah, I, I, wish, I wish we had the the uh, the, the financial uh, re recompense of of, uh, of Lindsay and Stevie. <laughs> yeah. by, the, by the time you get to uh, shoot out the lights, I mean that makes rumours seem just like a little tip <laughs> corner, doesn't it? I mean, <laughs> I, I mean, you know, I mean, listen, it's it, it's a great record, and you had a, it was a struggle to get it out. I know, but but you stop in the book and you don't describe what you know historically is now known as the tour from hell you don't describe oh, that yeah. it, does that feel just too personal richard when you and you, you and linda go on tour and and she's having to sing songs that you've written about the uh, your relationship failing yeah i mean it's, it's also bizarre isn't it um well uh, you know um I, I wanted to stop in 75 but because you know i i I, um, I thought 76 not that interesting 77 to 80 not that interesting uh, um and if i was going to pick it up again it would be in 81 with the tour from hell uh, do I have the, the stomach for writing that? I don't know. Maybe someone else should write it, or I, I, I could write it, I suppose. Or Linda. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> perhaps we'll, we'll write it jointly or something. Um, yeah. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I, I mean, but, but, but you know, if, if you like it in, you know, in my career, that, that's the next interesting point is 81. Uh, but but then from then on, things, things spread out, you know. Um, the reason I, I was happy to write, about 67 to 75 is, is essentially a compressed time period. And so much mm -hmm. happened in that period, it seems, you know, like six, 69, we had like three albums out. I mean, how, how do you do yeah, that? Yeah, I know. That, was, that, that is an insane thing. How did that even happen? Well, I, I don't know. It's nuts, you know. Yeah. Um, we just recorded all the time, I think, basically. Um, so, um, you, you know, the, the, if I did another volume, it would take like 20 years to, to, to have the same number of pages, if, if, in a sense, you know. Uh, because just the first time you do something, um you, you know everything's very alive and and you're, you're very awake to it you know the, the 15th time you, you, you're playing Scunthorpe you think well mm -hmm. you know well, what am I going to write about but the, you know the first time you know things happened and, and you remember it um if I, I do remember the first time playing at Scunthorpe not not being able to get into the venue because I didn't have a tie on <laughs> <laughs> no, but, no but I'm performing this evening I don't care who you are sorry I don't you haven't got a tie on you're not you're not, you're not getting in here you find your voice in the end, which is this wonderful baritone, but you sing in an accent that I, it is not, it's difficult to discern it, but it is definitely English, British 
sounding accent. Yeah. There's elements of the north of England in there. There's the, the, certainly elements of where you grew up in London. That that's all in this vocal. You go to America to live again and or to live, and allow American American music to come back into your life, but filtering it through these things that you've you've discovered about British folk music. Yeah. Well, well, well I think. Uh... You know, the, the aim of Fairport was, was all, always to be something of a synthesis, uh, you know, to take elements from rock music uh, and to put the traditional stuff into that as well. Um, so, so, you know, we were always, playing, there's all a little bit of, you know, uh, American style in, in in the drumming, you know, that there's, there's, always, there's always the backbeat there, you know, as opposed to, you know, a Scottish dance band drummer. We, 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 also, because we, magnificent rhythm section, always. A, on, absolutely fantastic. I mean, magnificent. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, yeah, um, I'm I'm privileged to to, to have of of uh, worked you know my whole life with with exceptional musicians. Yeah, because Maddox is is Maddox and Peg incredible, incredible. incredible. Fantastic. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely they, they, they are re really great great musicians. Uh, and and um, you know I'm, I'm so lucky to, to have uh, to, to to have fallen in with musicians uh, with, with such great um, you know first of all technique, but then feel you know just really great feel, mm. uh, which is a rare thing. Tell us about your songwriting, Richard, because as I said at the beginning, you know, you're, you're, you're very light and jovial and witty and, and, mm -hmm. and all those things that maybe you weren't when you were a younger man and maybe you were a lot shy, but your music can go to places that, you know, is incredibly dark. Yeah. Is that you or is that something that, that is in subconsciously you that you, you dig deep for when you're writing? I think it's a matter of digging. Um, no, but I've always been a kind of optimistic art person, uh, even when I was a kid. Um, surprisingly, I, you know, I wasn't a depressed teenager. I like to think I was, but I actually wasn't. Um, and uh, I, th I think as a writer, sometimes you, you do have to dig deep, 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 deep to, to find that place where um, there's human commonality. So, so, so that when you sing a song from that place, uh, other people in the audience can say, oh, I've been there, or you know that that sp that speaks for me. Um, to, to me, that, that's a very important thing is to be able to communicate, you know, humanity to, to other human beings. If the music seems a little dark, I mean, that, that's that's just the, the tradition I come out of. I mean, I mean, you, you look at all those ballads, you know, those traditional Scottish ballads, and, and it's kind of dark mm -hmm. stuff, you know. Always someone getting killed, wasn't there? Right? Yeah, yeah there's, there's always well, somebody getting killed. You know, she's always burying him by the roadside, isn't she? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> always, all the time. Yeah. Uh, um, yeah so, so, so that, that, that's just you know the, the kind of language that I grew up with. You know, it, it's it's like um, you know if, if you if you grew up with with the Louvin brothers in America, that you, you'd, you'd probably be expressing the, the kind of the, you know the darker side of country music. I, I mean, it's it's just uh, it's a thing. But but um, that doesn't mean people don't like it. It, it, it people appreciate. It. Yeah. Uh, when you sing those songs, people um, uh, c can really empathize uh, yeah, with, we, with what you're singing about. Yeah. Because we live life, most of life, in denial. And at times with art mm. and the communication of, of that, we, 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 we think, well, I'm not the only one feeling weird about all this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, but that, you know, that isn't to say that the music shouldn't should not also be uplifting and, and uh, joyous. Yeah. Uh, and have lots of choruses. I mean, really, uh, you know, um, uh, and if, if I could write more of those, I'd be very happy to. But it's been a, a massive pleasure and yeah, honour really. to talk to you. Absolute honour for me to thank you so much, really. Um, uh, just, uh, you yeah, so nice to, to, to meet you both uh, virtually and hopefully one day in the flesh. Oh, that was fantastic. I mean, I'm slightly fallen in love with him in that last hour. He's, he's such a nice guy, isn't he? Yeah, I'm afraid it showed, Gary. Uh, <laughs> a little awkward. Um, yeah, you, you know. I'll, I'll just, send an email. I'll clear everything up. Me and you are just going to end up like Richard and Linda ended up. I'm, I'm going to get out of it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to go and make a divorce album about you, guy. Yeah, the next year's Sources is going to be the tour from hell. <laughs> uh, you know, follow that, as they say. Um, yeah. Thank you for everyone who's been so kind uh, about our show on the internet and left nice things. Yes, and thank you for listening. Keep listening. Thank you to Ben. And uh, we'll be back with someone who hopefully has brilliant. Yes, yes. And it's good night from me. And good night from her.